Okay, we're almost complete, so let's get going. Uh, the first speaker this afternoon will be Nick Huggett uh, from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Please, Nick. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, it's great to be here, so thanks for all the people who've been working hard to organize this. And, um, yeah, I really appreciate it. So, okay, um, I want to make a fairly sort of one, I guess, fairly uh, short point, I think. Um, so, and it's about the way functional identification works, uh, is, as, as I see it, in um, quantum gravity, when we're trying to uh, think about the, uh, the reduction emergence <coughs> of um, space-time. So, if you've looked at the paper that I provided, it's the introduction to the book that I'm writing with Chris. And I'm actually, so, I hence the acknowledgement here. So, it sort of turned out when we were writing it that we were sort of thinking about functional identifications, not, a, uh, not in incompatible ways, but in, in different ways. So actually I'm going to present from the way I, I, I think about it, and Chris can sort of add or subtract in the, in the discussion, you know, what he agrees or, or disagrees about. So essentially the gist of the paper, there's I guess two things I want to do in the, in, in the talk. The first is um, to compare functional identification in quantum gravity and the emergence of space-time with functional identifications in the more sort of standard cases, say sort of mind-brain identifications, or um, the example that Lewis gives in, in the same paper, uh, in, in the functional uh, psychophysical and theoretical identifications, sort of light and electromagnetic waves. And maybe it's tendentious, maybe it's sort of simplifying in a useful way, I'm going to actually focus on the, the light EM case. So let's look at how this is supposed to go. And here are the two ways of sort of thinking about what's going on that, that, that merge together. So there's the way Lewis presents it, which is sort of in a sort of semantic mode. And the question, you're thinking about it from a logical point of view, and generally speaking, the question is, you know, you've got some theory and there's some theoretical terms in there, and the question is, what do they uh, refer to? Okay, so that's kind of the sort of semantic way of thinking about it. In a minute, um, I think this is how Chris, but that, that's the way I kind of come to this. <coughs> I'll talk about the sort of ontological mode of looking at this question. As I say, these are not kind of incompatible, they're just sort of different ways of sort of framing things, uh, I think. Um, and there the question is more focused on, you know, what are those things that, you know, what are the T's? What is their nature? Okay, so, but starting from the sort of semantic point of view, the picture, the general picture Lewis presents is, I have some theory, big T, um, which has some new theoretical terms, little t, in it, and the first question is, what do they, those T refer to? So the goal in the first place is to establish um, reference, you know, make, make them referential, understand how they're going to be referential. And the proposal is we do it, you know, sort of Brussels style, descriptively, using the, the theory big T. And then what's proposed is we define the theoretical terms this way. So... This weird operator was the closest they could get to the standard, you know, uh, definite article operator. So it means the unique. Okay. So the TR, the unique X that satisfy the theoretical predicate. Okay. Um, you know, the idea is this T of T, there's, you know, is a function of, you know, has some theoretical terms in it, but ideally it has a lot of. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm saying theoretical, but I, troublesome is the word I want to be using here. So troublesome terms, the ones we don't know what they refer to, or we want to establish that they refer to something. There'll be other terms in, in this big T, the OK terms, whose reference meaning is already sort of satisfactorily established. And, OK, so first of all, we propose this as a definition. So a few things to say about that. Um, 
different ways that, I mean, there's two main ways that, uh, really two. So how could this sort of fail to establish reference? Well, it could be, this is just false, so there isn't anything that, sort of a, that satisfies this. The theory, the theory could just actually turn out to be false. But again, it's important that this is the, you know, the, the unique object um, operator. It's the x that satisfy the, the, the theoretical predicate. Okay, so there have to just be one set of things here. Okay, so this has to be that, and this will come up later. It has to be that there's enough sort of uh, established meaning in T, so enough OK terms to actually pick out something uniquely when you when you write this. You kind of can't introduce too many new theoretical terms if you're going to be defining them this way. Right? If it was all theoretical terms, you'd basically just be describing some set theoretic structure, and then at most you'd have said cardinal something about cardinality or something like that. Okay. So this discussion, there's kind of two levels you want to be thinking about. One is, you know, just the, log the, the sort of logical level where this is just how I'm going to be defining things. The conclusion of this is going to be a functional identification. And at that point, you're going to have to actually have done more than just kind of written down a logical statement. You're going to have to actually accept, let's say, as a, as a scientific theory, big T of T. That has to be your theory. OK. So good. So there is kind of two aspects of the troublesome nature. Um, in the paper, or in the, in the chapter, we use troublesome just to talk about the problem of reference. And if all has gone well here, and you accept T, and these, you know, they're, they're, this really is, give you some unique entities, um, then you've solved the sort of referential problem. The second level of problem is a sort of metaphysical troublesomeness. And as I said, in the chapter, we don't call that troublesome, but I think I sort of am going to in this slide. So there's two kinds of trouble. So one is, what do these things refer to? The other is a more metaphysical, ontological trouble of what are these things? What is their nature? They seem kind of suspicious in some way. And that's what the full functional identification is going to um, be getting us. Okay, so we assume reference, we fix that problem. But these are funny things, you know? Well, you know, we've got, you know, what is the mind? So, you know, we've got a theory of psychology here, and so maybe we functionally define mental, ent mental objects in a general sense. But what are they? Are they really kind of, you know, reasonable, metaphysically, physically safe objects? Or do we have to be suspicious of what they actually are? Or perhaps light? I'm imagining here the theory will be something like the theory of geometric optics and the theory of the speed of light. Uh, but what kind of thing is light? Is it, is it really a physical thing? We still have a kind of question about what it is, even though we can talk, you know, we say it defined the term light and so it's referential. It doesn't really mean it seems we know exactly how it fits into the world and in particular into our sort of physical picture of the world. Okay, and so here's the story about how we go from the here, and this is the outline, what's usually called the Canberra plan. Um, so, so hence the background. So what we hope the, the plan is going to be, well, there's some other theory, big R, <coughs> with theoretical, with whose theoretical term, who's troublesome, whose terms are the little r. Okay, they may need to be functionally defined, but somehow big R is a theory that's not metaphysically, ontologically troublesome. That seems well grounded in the, uh, what we, how we understand the physical world to be. Moreover, this is a theory we believe to be, we accept. Um, I'll talk a bit about, uh, the last slide will come back to what acceptance means, but it's something like, you know, like take as being true, but well, that's one possible reason, uh, one possible meaning it might have. Okay. Then what we want to understand, what we, the thing to show is that these R's also do this T. They also satisfy the T predicate. Okay. 
So there's the, the Oz in the, the second theory, R, and we come to realize in some sense they also satisfy the theory, the, the, the theory predicate T. I'm going to gloss here, usually they're not literally going to do that individually. There's going to be something that in the chapter we call act sort of aggregation, coarse graining, combining together, sort of in consort together, they will do this. So in the paper, and you can, I didn't put it in to keep things sort of tidy, but anytime you sort of see an R, not in the big R theory, but in the, the big T theory, really there's some sort of aggregation going on. So what I really, when I write this, I kind of really mean like this, but I just kept things tidy, okay? Okay. Good. So this is just sort of, this is just recapitulating uh, Lewis, and I think even in the same, very same terms he did. And now there's just a simple, you can see, it's just a simple matter of logic that this statement and this statement entail that R and T are identical, or aggregates of R are identical with the T's. Okay? Because the T's are the unique things that, this says the T's are the unique things that satisfy T. We now think, and then we also put in that the R's satisfy T, and that logically entails that they're, those things are identical. So, you know, there's a number of things going on in Lewis's paper, uh, and maybe some of the important ones are not even kind of made explicit by him, but one of the things that is made explicit by him is he's arguing that bridge laws are set, I mean, that's how he puts it, the bridge laws are not sort of further empirical, are not empirical hypotheses. They're not things that need confirmation. Okay? This is, you know, broadly speaking, you know, a bridge law, but I don't need any empirical evidence for it once I've accepted this is the functional definition of functional definitions. This is a definition, and then this is a further fact that I, you know, I need empirical evidence to establish this. But once I've done that, there isn't a further step of introducing bridge laws. I just have the identification as a matter of logic. Okay, so that's the kind of general scheme. And, okay, so I gave you a, a talk for briefly now about the sort of ontological mode. Um, and then we'll sort of apply this, to, I'll give you an example, and then we'll apply it to space time. But of course the idea is, you know, in step one, I've, I've again, I've, I've solved the problem, you know, if this works and this, this definition kind of uniquely picks some things out, we've solved the problem of what do the T refer to? How do, you know, what are, our, what are the reference of our troublesome theoretical terms? And in step four, we've solved the uh, metaphysical problem. You know, the, the T's seem to be metaphysically troubling, but it's okay, they turned out to be R's, and the R's, we know how they fit into the physical world, it's, it's all good, everything is safe. So, as I understand it, you know, this is, this is the, the Canberra plan, is what I've just described. Um, I'll put the passages in, we also put this in sort of ontological mode in the paper, so I will kind of paraphrase what we put there, uh, and here we were kind of um, drawing from sort of how Jaguar Kim thinks about sort of functional identification, but to my mind these things really kind of really are the same thing, just sort of put in different terms. I think perhaps the point I want to make, though, is clearer in the semantic mode, so that's why I've kind of partly why I've focused on that. But at the very least, it became clearer um, to me in that in that form. So, right. So, I think these lines come from the paper with with Vincent, right? So this, I think that you you were drawing on this in. Kim, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. And I, in the paper, in the in the chapter, we intro there are sort of two steps to functional reduction. I put in another two so that it lines up with the four that I've got before. So, you know, thinking ontologically, what you're doing is specifying the causal roles that enter, the, you know, that identify the <coughs> upper level theoretical objects. It corresponds to step one. Second step 
it's in parentheses because it's sort of implicit in the chapter, but I wanted to sort of bring it out to be explicit here. Then we sort of have to accept a theory, you know, R, which tells us, you know, what the little r are, and we feel good about them. They're clearly part of the physical world. So, you know, the r, there's no kind of metaphysical worries that they're sort of strange things or not properly physical in some way. So we know what we actually have those. Then we have what we put in the, in the chapter, the sort of second step of the functional reduction is explain, you know, plus this, explain how the R fill the functional role that the T play, which obviously corresponds to step three, and clearly presupposes that we know what the R are and we, they're the kinds of things that we want, you know, that we can form explanations with. And then well, what you conclude from that is well, again, the T of the R, right? I mean, that's the um, functional reduction picture. The things that do this causal role, they're T's. Well, the R's do it, so that's what the, the T's are. So this now gives us the, um, again, the ontological reduction. Okay. So let's just run through how that goes. So that's the sort of abstract uh, way of thinking about it. I'm going to run through the first part in a... In another example, in, in, in the case of light, again, to sort of, at least at this stage, maybe in questions it'll come up, but avoid questions about mind and brain. So there's, there's the scheme. And so here's how it would sort of go step by step. So I'm interested in, you know, what light is. So first of all, I'm going to functionally define what light is. Well, maybe I should have had a picture of geometric objects or something, but I thought some, some lasers would be good. So, you know, but what, if you're thinking about what the T would be here, I would say, as I said, the sort of theory of geometric optics, um, plus some other well-established sort of facts about light, you know, the, the, the constant speed. Um, okay. So that tells us what light is. It's the thing that satisfies those sort of theoretical postulates. We're identifying it with electromagnetism, so there has to be, but you know, but light's kind of a weird thing. What, what, what kind of is that? Is it really properly physical? You know, as you know, sort of historically, there's a lot of different views about light and whether it's somehow something, I don't know, Aristotle thought it was something that came out of your eyes and sort of touched things. I mean, what, what's going on here? So I think it's, you know, it's a reasonable kind of case. Um, we need some part of the physical world that we, sort of understand and think is properly physical and is sort of unworrying and untroublesome. And that is the theory of electromagnetism. And, oh, I didn't put it in the slides. I took all the pictures. They're all of Creative Commons from, Wiki, you know, from Wikimedia. And I like that this, you know, this is a GIF. As you can sort of see, the electro, the field lines come on. The, we see the induction happening. The, the, the meter goes. So. You know, we have a theory of electromagnetism, and we, you know, through such concrete setups as this, you know, I have a coil here, coil here, and I have a reading going on here. You know, Faraday throwing the, the iron filings around the magnets to trace the field lines. We have, you know, this, this is a theory which kind of, you know, leads us to think that electromagnetic waves, they're fine, it's well understood, you know, meaningful, uh, totally physical uh, aspect of the world. Uh, I mean, okay, there's books where people wonder what fields are and so on, but as far as things are going here, electromagnetic fields, it's fine. We have a theory about that that we accept. <coughs> so here's the story. Um, okay, and what well, the next step, of course, is to come and realize that you know the waves that we have according to the Maxwell's equations that describe electromagnetic phenomena behave in exactly the way that um, light waves do. They have the speed of light, they satisfy the laws of um, geometric optics, and from that, well, we just apply the same, so there, there, oh, there, there we go. That's a, so the solution to the, to the, uh, the, the, wave, so the wave solution to the Maxwell equations, and it does everything that light does according to our theoretical postulate, and on that basis, well, once we've accepted one and three, 
it just follows, again, as a matter of deductive logic, that light is, in fact, um, electromagnetic waves, once you've accepted those things, according to Lewis. Okay. Um, sorry, it follows from them whether you accept them or not, but whether you accept it depends on accepting those. All right, so that's the sort of standard case. Now going to the space-time case. And I think this plan deserves a new name. So anyway, if anyone has an idea of a good one, uh, let me know. Okay, so but think about how this goes. So in the philosophy of mind case, in the mind uh, brain case, or the light uh, electromagnetism case. It's crucial that it's the higher level, un, you know, the higher level theory is the troublesome one, partly sort of to be what the theoretical terms refer to, but also sort of ontologically, metaphysically. And we, you know, solve that problem according to the Canberra plan by looking at a lower level theory where things are definitely physical and everything is, is, is we're happy with, and that's how we solve our problem. In the space-time case, the situation is reversed. Okay. Because the higher level case is space-time. Well, those terms are going to be troublesome already. But it's the lower level quantum gravity case where we have the big trouble. What, what, you know, what, what is the quantum gravity stuff? Okay, why is it troublesome? Well, let's just assume for the purposes of this discussion Right now, the, it's troublesome because it's non-spatio-temporal in some significant way. So, Niels was kind enough to swap talks, so this claim wouldn't be, have been undermined already. But we will return <laughs> to this kind of hypothesis later. Uh, right now, I, I just let me just sort of put it there, you know, by assumption. If the quantum gravity theory is genuinely non-spatio-temporal, then that's going to be very troublesome stuff that we're talking about here. And there's no sense in which we're going to get to feel better about the space-time, you know, or we're going to sort of <coughs> vindicate the space-time uh, objects in terms of sort of better quantum gravity objects. Yeah. Metaphysically, they are very peculiar. And in fact, we want the process to work the other way around. Yeah. We're going to get to feel better about the quantum gravity because of, its, because of the way it reduces the upper-level space-time uh, stuff, for want of a better word. Okay, so let me just run that sort of through. So, again, sort of, you know, sort of referential and metaphysical troubles, troubles here. First of all, sort of, uh, you know, in the referential question, you can't play the standard Lewis trick and give a functional definition of the elements of quantum gravity because... I mean, it's, it's a bit quick here, but if the theory really is a non-spatio-temporal one, what one expects is there simply aren't enough kind of uh, enough okay terms in it to actually make to actually make a proper definition. Even supposing I've got some theory QG of Q that's that's true, if there are few or no okay terms, I'm just going to describe as it were, you know, a first uh, just a sort of set of you know first order relations between the, the elements, but that's not going to be enough to pick out anything specific in the world. We're sort of talking about just picking out some sort of set theoretic structure, and that's not enough. We actually want to be able to, the Q have to refer to things, in, you know, real things, physical things in the world. So that's not going to work. Um, also, I've indicated, you know, the, the the metaphysical question is going to have, the metaphysical vindication is going to have to go differently as well. But still, we can still run the sort of basic Lewis um, scheme here and see what happens. The, the, the same basic logic is, logical, you know, points of deductive logic are going to work. But we're going to have to sort of rethink how they're related to one another. Okay. So first of all, we will... Um, functionally define the space-time terms. Okay, so we've done that. Um, 
it's true we probably have to do that to um, you know, make the space-time terms referential. So one project is going to be talking about what the you know, functional roles of space-time, of what the functional role of space-time is. Next, someone's going to have to propose some theory of quantum gravity, QG, that's about the Q. As I've said, that's, you know, this is not going to be generally enough to allow us to actually make the Q referential. We are going to have to come to accept that the <coughs> Q, or again, the aggregates of the Q, actually play the space-time roles. You know, that's what a lot of quantum gravity is about, right? I mean, you write down the theory and then you show how various spatio-temporal structures can be derived from them. Well, Chris and I've written a book about that, so okay, that, that, that's sort of, you know, that, that's the thesis of the book essentially. So I've written different words here. In line two, we don't accept this theory. We have no real reason to accept this theory. The way you should think about what's happening in step two is somebody proposes the theory. You know, they propose loop quantum gravity, string theory, causal set theory, um, group field theory. And then what they try to show is how to recover um, space time in this functional way from that quantum gravity theory. At some point, hopefully, we come to accept that those quantum gravity objects really play the space-time role. That's the really hard part, and I'll come back to that. There's a lot, this, when we've done step three, that's essentially when we're accepting the, quantum, the theory of quantum gravity and accepting that that is the account of what space-time is. Okay, and then we still have the logical point that one and three entail the Q, that the quantum gravity objects um, are the space-time objects. At that point, we can now also um, infer from this, right, I mean, it's just a sort of substitution, that the Q, or the aggregates of the Q, can be defined as the things that play the space-time role. And that's essentially a point we made in the empirical incoherence paper, though I think all this was kind of less clearly worked out at that point. So now I've solved the referential problem, once I have one and three. This is not a point of logic. I'm accepting that the Q, it's, I don't think anyway, that, that the Q actually play, or aggregates of the Q play the space-time role, doesn't logically <coughs> entail that the theory of quantum gravity is, is true. But obviously that's the thing we're thinking. I mean, it depends what's built into acceptance, exactly. But it's in virtue of accepting three that um, the evidence, you know, basically what I'm saying is the evidence that the, this is our theory of quantum, our correct theory of quantum gravity comes because the Q can play the space-time role. Or comes with the belief that the uh, Q can play the space-time role. Okay, and we can run that sort of ontologically as well. So, uh, there we go. Specify, this is... Um, Space-time functionalism, one, we specify the identifying role, such as space-time localization, dimensionality interval, that identifies space-time. That corresponds to step one. We propose some, let me call them non-spatio-temporal atoms. Uh, don't read too much into the word atom there, but whatever the non-spatio-temporal stuff <coughs> is, because atom is kind of a useful word, and that, but it's one Daniel Ariti likes to use, and it's kind of useful here. Um, yeah, so I don't mean quite atoms in the way you do. Just in a, just, it's, I just need a, a word there. Whatever the basic ingredients of the of QG are. Then we explain. Sorry, I'm going. Ahead. I'm looking at the one that had. Explain how the atoms actually fill those roles, and then again we conclude from that that the atoms or aggregates of the atoms are space time. Okay, so, you know, I, I find it helpful to think in the logical way, but you know, we can also think about this story that's going on at the, at the same time. Okay, um, so, example of how that's supposed to sort of work. Okay, so we've got our space-time theory, so there's the space, 
Um, we're going to define in some way what the uh, what space time is using our theory, using our functional um, definition. <coughs> Step two, we come up with or somebody comes up with a, a theory of quantum gravity just proposed as a formal theory. Um, and ah, right. So I'm, I'm going with the uh, metaphor of atoms, or rather than molecules, as it turns out here. This is this is you know, water in its liquid state, and what we find is in suitable states, um, those atoms aggregate together in a way that makes them behave like space-time. So this is sort of step three, and because we've done that, that you know this is really this. That entails that the space-time, our identity, that the space-time and the, uh, the space-time stuff really is the uh, non-spatio-temporal atoms. We can now make that we now have that the act that the spatio that, that the cues um, are referential. They refer to the space to non-spatio-temporal atoms that play the space-time role in the prescribed way. Right, so we need that so that we actually can refer to things. And of course, you know, coming to believe that this really is this is the point at which we can, you know, come to be can have confirmation that this theory of the space non-spatio-temporal atoms is really correct. Okay, so but things are going in sort of totally the opposite way. It's not that we now feel good about space-time, or we sort of feel that the metaphysical puzzles about space-time have been resolved, because we've seen that it's really just composed of some more fundamental stuff that we're, we think is metaphysically or ontologically unproblematic. We've come to think that this is metaphysically unproblematic because it can play the space-time role. Things are exactly the other way kind of around now. Last slide. I know I'm a little over, but so that's what the that, this is what the ah oh, yeah yeah right if that's what it's supposed to show. That's what the uh, chapter said, and on the basis of that, I had a really interesting conversation with um, Baptiste by email. Um, it was probably a year ago now, so. I think it was after the talk I gave in Pittsburgh, probably. I don't know, there was some talk that I gave that we were talking about. And I just wanted to sort of, I think we sorted out a number of sort of communication, uh, miscommunications, and I made clearer what I thought was kind of going on here. Um, I don't want to kind of attach any of this to him, and he can you know, own it later if, if you want, but whatever. But I think just some things I want to say that, to sort of try to clarify what's going on here. So, obviously, the sort of background worry is, you know, are we done? <laughs> Have we now sort of vindicated um, every, you know, is everything sort of vindicated here, especially the, uh, uh, yeah. Have, have we done enough? Yeah, let me just put it that way. Is there an explanatory gap between quantum gravity and space-time left over? So one of the, and maybe, you know, so this is one of the main points I want to kind of make from pointing out how things are reversed in space-time functionalism compared to ordinary, you know, psychophysical functionalism, for instance, is kind of all the all the work is really, you know, given that we have space-time theories, it's like all the epistemic work. Obviously, there's sort of formal work and you know, creative work to be done at two, and you know. But sort of epistemically, in terms of coming to accept theories and um, accept vindications, every all the action is at step three, coming to actually believe, accept that the cues, the quantum gravity atoms, can actually play the space-time role. So, what actually is achieved at step four, what it is to come to sort of accept all these things really is going to depend on what's packed into this word acceptance. So, I mean, in a sense, a lot of the, the if you read more of the introduction, the chapter that, I, that was posted, 
it's a long discussion of what it is to sort of accept. And we have quite a, a fairly thick notion of acceptance, but maybe not the thickest possible notion. So, just to be clear about where, what, at least what I think is going on in acceptance, and I, I think Chris is on the same page here. So you might think to sort of accept that the cues play the space-time role is, I'm simply talking formally here. There's just some mathematical proof that, you know, in terms of the law, the quantum gravity laws, the QG, um, that in fact, you know, this is true. Right? It's just purely formal. So that is not enough for what, what I think what I have in mind and for what um, Chris has in mind. And I think, yeah, this is where we were talking about realism and kind of anti-realism. This is just sort of instrumentalism. So it's neither scientific nor a kind of meta metaphysical realism here. This would just be that formally, I can derive this from this. But acceptance should be more than that. I actually want to think that there really are these quantum, you know, quantum gravity atoms, these non-spatio-temporal atoms, and I want to be a scientific realist about the quantum gravity theory. So, to cut you know, quite a long discussion in that introduction into sort of one line, what I take it, I think we take, I, I take it, and I think Chris does as well, is acceptance here means that this derivation in the language we use there is physically salient. So the question here, you know, so the idea here is from a physical point of view, we have a physically satisfactory explanation of how it is that the Q are playing the space-time role. It's not just formal, but somehow the steps of the formal, the, of the der formal derivation, the assumptions of the formal derivation, really track true physics. They're really physically salient. And that's a significant challenge under the hypothesis that we in fact have a non-spatio-temporal theory because all our sort of <coughs> ideas about what I would say or account as a, as a valid science physical explanation assume space-time. They're sort of spatio-temporal explanations. So there's going to be a lot of work trying to figure out what counts as an adequate explanation, as a physically salient explanation, once one's trying to achieve step three. That's partly why there's a lot of work there. This is not a con it's not just going to be formal. One has to really rethink what counts as, you know, as an as explanation in physics. So, in the introduction, Chris and I boldly claim that when we've done that, there's no explanatory gap, there's no hard problem. That's that's done. That that's enough. On the basis that you know that's kind of packed into what it means to be physically salient. The question is, and I think that's almost where I'm going to be sort of sort of finishing, is, is there something more? Some kind of, you know, I don't mean metaphysical realism in the sort of dumb it sort of sense or anything like that. But there's some other kind of further realism or some further question it's not just enough that this explanation is physically salient, somehow it has to be metaphysically salient as well. So, that's what I, and I think Chris is uh, skeptical about. Maybe this is a useful way of sort of framing what's going on. We think we can pack enough into physical <coughs> salience to close off there being any kind of question at sort of step three, if that's helpful. Okay. And I already made this point. But what it is to be physically salient is sort of highly non-trivial, and in some sense that's partly what's going on in the book, is trying to figure out what is going to count as an explanation in these cases. Um, as I said, because we're talking about a theory that by hypothesis is non-spatio-temporal, what actually will do this okay, is up for grabs, is something that has to be kind of worked out. Okay, that's it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we will now have enough Lucy. <laughs> but instead, oh, Emilia, yes, yes. Emilia Marconi, who uh, is from the University of Florence, 
in the universities of Florence, Pisa, and Geneva. That's the easiest way to put it, maybe. Please. Thank you. So thank you, Chris, and thanks for this very interesting uh, chapter, and thanks to the organizer for allowing me to uh, share my comments on this uh, on this paper. So as Nick has tremendously well explained, the paper discusses one of the recently advanced strategies to deal with the emergence of, spa of space and from a putative non-spatial temporal background, namely the functionalist strategy. And the rationale underlying this strategy is because some of the approaches, the currently developed approaches to QG, suggest that fundamental ontology may be not characterizable in, uh, as a quantized continuum field or gravitational field. So the problem becomes how to recover that space-time and if ever that space-time gets recovered. Um, so now I just want to pinpoint some very three interesting aspects that I, I think emerge from the paper and that I would like to hear more from Nick and from all the people here in the room. Um, so the first worry that I have in mind is whether this functionalist strategy in the context of space time is functionalism enough in general. So as in other contexts, but as Nick has explained with much more details, the idea also in the context of space time is that of identifying what may play, what, what is to be realized, what role should be realized. And so according to uh, Chris and Nick, that should be able to provide a basic metrical and topological property. And then try to see, try to identify what in the fundamental ontology may play that, uh, that specific role. And um, so my, uh, my feeling is that I'm not sure whether that <coughs> makes justice to the functionalist strategy in general, I mean from an historical point of view, in the sense that surely uh, both types of functionalists have it that what it is to be a certain entity acts is to stand in the appropriate set of relations that make that entity act as an X. But it looks as if in other contexts, such as in the philosophy of mind, uh, there is a strong connection between functionalism and multiple realizability uh, to such an extent that something joyful, painful, and the like uh, may be realized by human beings, by silicon based uh, states of uh, hypothetical Martians, or other artificial states of androids. So I'm wondering what is the destiny of that type of multiple realizability whenever one picks out a specific approach to QG. So if one takes one specific approach to QG, where does this functionalist, this type of multiple realizability that is attached to functionalist go? What, what is the destiny of that multiple realizability? And whether you would not think otherwise that the relationship between this putative non-special temporal background and the emergent one uh, may be something, uh, something analogous, analogous to what happens in thermodynamics. And so whether in that case the relationship between microscopic and macroscopic uh, configurations can be characterized in functional uh, terms, whether this is the case. Um, then my second point is that what I personally think, what I personally take as one of the most interesting aspects of the functional strategy in the context of space time, and I would be happy to hear your opinion and the opinion from other people in the room, is precisely that of stating that no matter what the ultimate theory may turn out to be, whether there is an ultimate theory, we have good reason to think that Q of T and GR should be enough secured and that the functionalists have the merit of trying to pinpoint what may be that role that needs to be somehow fulfilled. So in the current state in which we do not uh, have a fully developed approach to QG, I think that one of the most interesting import of the functionalist strategy is precisely from the heuristic point of view. And I would like to hear if you agree with that and whether you would be content if that is enough to ask from the functionalist strategy. And uh, then my, my final comment is on the notion of empirical validability and the last part that you discussed about, um, and the way in which that discourse is connected to that of grounding. So uh, traditionally speaking, we talk about grounding when there is a certain type of relation, or as Fein prefers to call it, uh, um, property between entities and facts that are connected by some constitutive form of dependence. And so in this scenario, it looks as if, as was uh, very well explained by Nick, the, the situation is somehow inversed in the sense that what are taken as the troublesome uh, terms in QG are uh, put in a, a firm ontological footing whenever they can be identified with special temporal terms. So uh, another thing that, I, that I, it seems to come up from the paper, and, but it's not fully developed in that sense, is that it may, look, it may be well the case in this context that the notion of grounding, which is typically taken as 
what rounds what is taking a small fundamental of what is rounded, somehow is here is reversed in the sense that at least epistemically, but if that is strongly non spatial temporal, also spatial temporally grounded in a theory that for other reasons we may conceptualize as less fundamental. So um, I would be happy to hear about this um, okay. comments. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, no, thank you. Those are really great questions. Um, the first one, especially since that was the question I was really hoping no one was going to ask. <laughs> um, and I don't know quite what to say about that. You know, when I was sort of, I, I, and I feel sort of embarrassed that I haven't sort of thought this through enough. Um, so maybe somebody can help me out here. I mean, I sort of a, at one stage had a slide up here that I was imagining holding, you know, mad space time, Martian space time or something like that. Uh, it's very, it, it's true. So I actually don't kind of know exactly how Lewis pulls it off. I, it's a long time since I read the paper because it sort of looks like the identities sort of block the multiple realizability. So I'm not actually, so what I'm hoping is that the, the Lewis solution to that will also kind of be okay. Now, I'm perhaps a little less worried about it in the space-time case than in the mind case. Because I sort of, you, I, I mean, the kind of cases that he sort of, you know, considers where you can actually sort of imagine beings that are in pain, even though their brains are rather different for us, seems like actually quite compelling that those kinds of things are possible and, you know, perhaps actual. Chris was more keen on the, uh, now that sounds like I'm punting it off to you, on the sort of idea of multiple realizability. For me, you know, wow, if we can get one of these to work, uh, that might be space time. Uh, but I guess you might think it, it, there might be some that were possibly space-time, but were sort of empirically distinguished. Yeah, maybe I should be more worried about this. All right, so that's a kind of plea, for, for, uh, an apology and a plea for, sort of, for help on, on that one. Um, okay, could you say in a sentence what was the second one? Sorry. The second one is on heuristic import of the yes, strategy. Yes, yes, excellent, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, because this sort of looks like it's chron chronological, right? I, th I think that's the way I would, you know, the way it looks like. Well, first we have to sort of propose, and then we sort of see if it can, you know, we can pr reproduce sort of space-time features from that theory. Yeah, this is, you know, it's not really supposed to be historiography or something. It's supposed to be kind of just breaking out, breaking things down logically. And then, yeah, I totally agree that, of course, no one's going to be proposing this without an eye to being able to recover space-time, and in particular, thinking about what Neil also talked about, you know, what aspects of space-time we're going to kind of hold on to in the lower, in the quantum gravity theory, mm -hmm. to sort of figure out what it is we want to propose. Is that, that, yeah, that was the yeah. question. Yeah, no, so totally in terms of methodology, these are kind of blurred together, but, you know, Lewis gives us this structure where mm -hmm. they kind of come out as logically distinct steps. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And then, Sorry, the third one. Was in like an inverse form of grounding, whether you think that it might be possible. Ah, yeah. I think, did I say grounding in the talk? Or that I think no, I've been really kind that. of <laughs> trying to avoid saying grounding, to, again, to avoid that, that <laughs> question. Okay. And I think it's okay, I see what you think, but I think it's okay. Um, I've tried to put it so, you know, we've got the problem, you know, the trouble of reference and the trouble of sort of metaphysical vindication. And I don't think solving either of those kind of requires grounding in the, in the sort of metaphysical sense. You know, the, the question of definition is sort of a logical one, semantic one. I just want to be able to say some, you know, give you a, a description that actually uniquely picks the quantum gravity thing atoms out. And I'm not saying anything is grounded in anything. I'm just going to tell you some facts about them here that, will, that they and only they answer that description. And I think grounding is a thicker notion than that. But even the metaphysical vindication is not really grounding. I and mean, if you're really taking identity series seriously, that's what they are. I mean, it's not like one's more fundamental or one kind of grounds the other. Uh, I don't have the picture of the space time now, but... You know, that's what it is. I, they're okay. I know they're okay, and I don't have sort of metaphysical worries about them because 
they are the things that make up space time, and that's okay. So, I said make up. Okay, you might say that sounds like a synonym for grounding, but I mean make up in a sort of physical sense. They have mm -hmm. a physical story about how they make them up. If, if that's all, if that's what grounding is, maybe that's okay. Okay, so even if you drop the grounding like parlance, which is, I admit is a bit ambiguous, uh, when you say that that two entities get identified, then you specify that that like. S in that case corresponds to like an, an, uh, an aggregate operator. And so that in this sense, how would you situate this with respect to the discourse on emergence and fundamentality? This is like a collective behavior of the pieces of underlying. Yeah. So sorry, what? Uh, yeah, no, it's just it, even if you drop the ground <coughs> uh, terminology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what, how would you characterize that? So I am deliverance? saying right, that's what the Q are. They are these aggregates. Mm. Uh, you know, aggregates of the cubes are the, are the space-time stuff. So what more? So so that there may be like an explanatory notion and maybe called feasibility, an ontological gap between what happens there and what happens in that case. Otherwise, you just drop the emergence uh, the reference to emergence, because if you said that those Good. are okay. just uh, fun uh, equally fundamental, then you're not considering the, the role of, say, also the aggregate operator, or maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, yeah, no, no, good, good, no, I think I'd like to, I feel happier with the question now, it doesn't have grounding in it, okay. I guess, so, yeah, so, so this, I think, and then is all sort of built into this, you know, this physical salience, yeah. I mean, is that there's a legitimate physical explanation of how it is that when we aggregate these things, mm -hmm. they behave like this? Okay. So, I guess I don't have a, th I don't have a, a sort of a, a more elaborate sort of general account of sort of emergence. But I mean, in a sense, I think this sort of that's all I want to say about emer about sort of emergence and reduction and. That's what it is. That's how it, there, I don't, there isn't some other story I need there. What I need is to work out what physical stories I can actually tell in this context. Okay. So it's sort of physics rather than yeah, sure. met metaphysics here is what I have, have in mind. But it sounds like you're pressing that there may be something more to say at sort of step three here, perhaps. No, to, just to clarify, I'm not referring to the relationship between S and Q, but what is supposed to... Uh, together form the S with respect to Q. So you mean, so what counts as an alpha? No, 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 the, the, the elements that figure in that uh, aggregate operator. So what is the relationship between the elements figuring there and the Q that you identify in the higher level, lower level, if you want to call it. Here. Right. So I think that that is the question of what is, you know, okay. what counts as physical <laughs> salience. So Okay, so go, go to another part of the, the introduction. Um, you know, if you think about, one could sort of think about talking about um, sort of ideal gas theory in terms of kinetic, kinetic gas model. Okay, and so we sort of functionally identify, so with the, the upper theory is about you know, pressure and temperature. Okay, and then we can run the, run the same story. And so, we, you know, we can, Talk about what you know when we think about pressure. You can refer to you know what's happening on a pressure gauge. You know, okay, I've got these gauges and it's reading a certain pressure. And if I have temperature, I put a thermometer in and it's reading a certain uh, temperature on the you know, the mercury is risen a certain height. And the kind of physically salient sort of derivation of the ideal gas. You know, the, the reason the sort of kinetic gas model looks like a really nice physically salient derivation is. Well, pressure comes out to be just to hold the atoms kind of bashing on the, the on the pressure gauge, and so of course there's momentum transfer. So, okay, or the temperature, the atoms are colliding with the with the thermometer, and that's causing their atoms to bounce around, and so everything um, expands. So, right? I mean, that's a sort of that's. The story, the, the kind of story I'm telling there is based on, on sort of principles of physical explanation and our understanding of what counts as a good explanation. And I guess for me, that's the story that we need, you know, to actually convince us. Uh, so 
So that's an example of the sort of story that will be physically salient, but we need something very different in the quantum gravity case because we're not going to be able to appeal to spatiotemporal processes in that way. Okay. So I will say one word about what, why I would talk about emergence in this case, in the quantum gravity case, and not the uh, ideal gas, kinetic gas sort of <coughs> case. It's exactly I, I, because I think, you know, one way of sort of thinking about why I would talk about emergence here, well, I think in the, in the chapter we sort of talk about the great difference between a theory that's spatiotemporal and one that's not spatiotemporal. Put it, I was thinking about a way of making that a little thicker is exactly this point is we don't know what it is to give a good explanation, you know, a physically valid explanation in terms of a theory without space time. And in a sense, that's a way of sort of seeing the, the gulf between that has to be bridged here that sort of vindicates the word emergence, but not, not in the full sense that philosophers often give it. Okay. I don't know, was that yeah. kind of stabbing yeah, yeah, roughly yeah. in the kind of the way I'm thinking yeah, about sure. it in Thank terms you. of emergence? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Sakshi, please keep up your hand for a second. Sakshi. Yes, yeah, so I have two questions and perhaps they're related. I am trying to make sense of how this identity relation allows you to keep some sort of account of emergence because, and maybe this depends on how you define emergence, but from what I understand, even in thermodynamics, although the definition of say temperature as average kinetic energy involves an equal sign, there's some novel behavior that you need to account for too on the higher level description. And it's not clear to me, especially if we're talking about emergence in terms of a transition, let's say around the Big Bang between a state that seems to have no effective space time uh, you know, and then going to one that does. So I'm not sure how the fourth step could capture that aspect of emergence. And then my second question is, also when we talk about this identity relation, um, you know, even something like a table is equal to the atoms that make up the table. It doesn't seem like there's a negation in one of the elements. But here, we're saying space-time is equal to non-spatiotemporal atoms. And I don't know if that's a terminological thing that can be done away with. But to me, it sounds kind of strange to then have that identity make sense. Yeah, yeah, good, good. So the second point, yeah, first, I think it's sort of a, uh, my idea is that it's, and I guess I already did, is that it's addressed by, you know, because of this, uh, this aggregation. It's when I have them sort of put together in the right way, then there's space time. So they aren't kind of in general. Uh, this is just, yeah, so this is a, a shorthand here. So you're saying even though the element we're defining as non-spatiotemporal, the aggregate operator doesn't make it a pure negation, basically. Yeah, no, but that's what this says, I guess, right? The right aggregates of non-spatiotemporal stuff is spatiotemporal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, but that seems to be, I mean, I think that's the kind of general, yeah, that's the sort of general pattern that, uh, you know, one has in this sort of reduction cases, right? You know, typically, you're in one way or another yeah. reducing the many degrees of freedom in the underlying, underlying theory to a few degrees of freedom in the higher theory, and that's kind of the I general idea of aggregation that I would have here. I think there's an, there is another question that it's... Uh, so there's two things I want to say, I just say, I think which is the best order to say them. Um, I don't think it matters. It sort of fits in here. This is all quite an idealized, well, this is all a massive sort of idealization, really, to think about it this way. I mean, not just because of this sort of historic, you know, the way it's doing things historically. You know, of course, 
we don't really believe this because we expect there to be kind of quantum gravity to say produce corrections to our space-time theory. So all of this somehow has to be sort of, and I think this is, I don't know whether it can even be done in sort of Lewis's framework. Really all these things have to be, they need somewhere to have sort of approximately operators inserted in them in some way. And so things, but then you end up with sort of approximately identical. Or, uh, that's all just kind of fudged here. And I think in the, the introduction is just a sort of footnote that sort of highlights the way I would fudge it is by saying, you know, this is kind of an idealization of what's exactly going on here. So I think that there was in the back of some of your questions, there was like that, could it literally be those things? <coughs> but they, of course not, because they're going to behave slightly differently from the space-time stuff that's going to be higher order correction. Than... Right. So that has to sort of, uh, yeah. Again, that's another thing I'm kind of punting on, but I think that's just sort of endemic in any kind of reductive story that goes on in science. So I don't feel too bad about punting on, on that one. And yeah, you, I, I'll just say that's what I said about defining emergence, how I'm kind of using emergence again. And uh, no, actually that's good. The thing I just said sounds a bit like what you were thinking about in the ideal, you know, sort of ideal gas, kinetic gas kind of, kind of case as well. Yeah. Absolutely, that has that. That's in the background there. Um, so, do you think allowing for like an approximately <coughs> identical operator would still give you the emergence of the phase transition sort? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So that one too. So, so putting aside the question of you know, what are, what is a phase transition when there's no time? Right. <laughs> Putting that aside, yeah, no, I think it would be, you'd have different phases where, right, sometimes you could aggregate them and this would come out true, and in other phases you couldn't aggregate, they wouldn't be the right aggregates for this to kind of come out to be true. Yes, good, that was the other sort of thought there. The aggregation is kind of, yeah, is important here. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, we have quite uh, a line here, Lorenzo, please. Yes, um, I'm not sure that, you know, your uh, condition one, Definition one is going to escape the Lubenheim school and or things like that. Uh, I think that you will always be able to have a purely mathematical structure which will satisfy whatever axiom you have. So I'm nonetheless I'm sympathetic with this approach still. And my suggestion, the way I would do it is you would fix the quantum gravity theory first, and then you say, okay, whatever satisfies this condition and is definable from the primitives of the quantum gravity theory. So uh, that excludes uh, um, relation which you can define from mathematics, but not from the primitive physical notion of the, of the particular theory you're looking at. So I guess my point is, that, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm thinking about it exactly the opposite way way to that, right, and the, the whole reason it's crucial, and it, so I, yeah, it's crucial in the, I'll, I'll leave this up, but imagine this was just a sort of general case rather than the, if, it's crucial to the Lewis idea about how to define theoretical terms, right, or troublesome terms, that the theory contain okay terms, terms that are not troublesome. That's how you're supposed to escape sort of indeterminacy of reference problems, because they there are enough relations there. That yeah. It is the unique things that stand you know that stand in the already understood relations. That's the hope. Otherwise, there's no kind of yeah, but one book. <laughs> okay. So, all right, but that's a disagreement with the whole kind of approach, right? Well, I'm not with the spirit, I think, but with the some tweaking. Either you. Is the notion of naturalness, so you have the most natural thing that satisfies this condition, or you try to well, say what it is, and then you say, okay, uh, whatever things and relations which are definable from what they take to be physical and which satisfy this condition. And I think it gets out with both. Ah, okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that, 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 the naturalness bit well, may well be kind of right that's needed as well. It's not just kind of arbitrary sets and arbitrary kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, good, good, good. Yeah, no, that, that may well be kind of baked into this as well, yeah. 
But that sounds like a different answer from the bit you were saying about defining the quantum gravity bit first. Because what I do want to say is, right, I can't just give the equivalent thing for the, I can't just define away the cues in this way because even given natural this, there just won't be enough already defined okay terms in the theory of quantum gravity because it's so radically different. Oh no, we're just saying that you need to add the notion of naturalness and maybe one way not to take it as a primitive is to say but a weak notion of naturalness just means definable from the primitives of the quantum gravity. But the primitives of the right, the primitives of the quantum gravity are without meaning. That's the problem. I mean that's the problem here. So that's I just, that doesn't seem like it's going. That's okay. kind of the point. That, that's why I have to go the other way. This is the only way I actually have, yeah, assume naturalness. This is the only way I have to define the the quantum gravity terms. Okay. It's not going to work to to try and define them first. Yeah, you cannot define both. Yeah. yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. So yeah. So it's really interesting. I um, I want to suggest another option between you and Lewis and to see why you didn't go this way. So when you, re when you sort of don't do the Lewis thing, you kind of reverse the epistemic story as well. So in his epistemic story, you've got you know, these troublesome things, you want to kind of try to understand like the mind, what the hell is that? How could it be physical? Here's a picture. Then you turn it around and you say, well, quantum gravity, what the hell is that? Here's how we understand it in terms of space-time. You don't have to have that kind of epistemic layer, it seems to me, on the, on, the, on the Lewis program, right? You can just be like, look, we want a thing, here's a theory, let's find the thing in the theory. And it doesn't confirm the theory, it doesn't, maybe doesn't contribute to other sorts of things. And I'm curious as to why you have this sort of added idea that it confirms the underlying theory, rather than just, like, here's a step that we're going to need to take in order to understand the ontological connection between the two theories. And then, you know, it doesn't really give you any epistemic boost. And the reason I'm curious is because I guess I'm slightly worried about the idea that it's going to confirm a theory um, and, and what, what this kind of confirmation would be because it's some kind of, I don't want to say non-empirical confirmation, but like it's a different kind of confirmation to the kind of confirmation that we might be used to, I think. Right. Um, good, good, good. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's nice you kind of picked up on this as well. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure sort of what, what to say, except, so going back to the sort of standard, you know, psychophysical identification, mm. right? Right, it's, it's a matter of deductive logic that I get the identity um, out at the end. Mm. But that I've now sort of vindicated the, the, the psychological, I mean, it seems to depend on that I actually do think that the physical theory is true, for instance. So Logically that, speaking, it doesn't, right? You don't need the, to, to run that, to run that, that identification, nothing needs to be true. Well, no, no, but I, okay, it's good, 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 but I want this argument not just to be valid, I want it to be sound. Uh, I think it can all be framed conditionally, so it can all be sound without having to actually say that anything in the, any particular theory is true. It's just like, if you accept this, then that, and if you do this, then that, and if you do those two things, then you can have this kind of identity. So let's see, so the thought was, right, sort of one and three, right, entail, so entail the identity, but if I actually want to sort of be compelled to accept the identity, then I have to actually take one and three as being true. Yeah, but I think they could be conditional statements, conditional on acceptance, rather than actually saying that you do in fact accept anything. I see. So you would say, so okay, so I would, okay, I would just have a, the thing I was accepting would be the sort of whatever the conditional. Yeah. You know, yeah. If if one three then this. Yeah. yeah, but I want to be a realist about this, right? So I actually don't just want it to be kind of conditional. I think I do want I this to be how things are. I see. Is that sort of... Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take up too much time, so maybe I'll follow this up with you. Okay, with but I'm happy to be kind of yeah. pressed on that, because I do certainly feel yeah. that exactly what, what the epistemology here is... I feel like you can do it in an epistemically lightweight way, that okay. might still do the things that you want, is, is my thought. But yeah. I'll follow it up with you later. That's what I think as well. Uh, can I just, actually, I'm just... Okay. But I'm not sure I see this as a sort of 
bug rather than a feature. I mean, oh, I wasn't. I, I wasn't saying it's a bug. Part of the question yeah. is, you know, how do you actually come to accept the theory of quantum gravity? Sure, sure. It might be this way. I yeah. suppose. I guess that's that's an option. I mean, it is surely going to be more than just accepting this because you're, again, you'll want to sort of that you'll want there to be unique empirical signatures for the theory that you're adopting. Yeah. It's not yeah, just yeah, enough yeah, to get yeah. GR back out of it. Yeah. 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 I mean, in the sense in which there is multiple realizability, even in this picture, I mean, it's been illustrated by Maria on that uh, uh, yeah. uh, sheet where you've got the same sort of space time is realizable potentially by the quantum gravity and string theory. And I guess the difference with the mental case is that we don't think that like, the actual fundamental physics allows for both types of space time in the same way. We do think the actual fundamental physics allows for like our pain and also Martian pain. Um, but why, why should that matter? We're still kind of scope for multiple realizability. You just have to go to another possible world to get it. I mean, I wouldn't like that, but lots of people would. Yeah, yeah. No, I think when I was trying to answer that question, that kind of was flashing through my mind, and I was trying to sort of say that as well. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Just that there might be only one way that space time is actually realized does not kind of make this less of a worry. Yeah. But that doesn't answer how I, how I solve the problem. <laughs> that means I have to go. Kind of... Why is it a problem? Sorry? Why is there a problem in that? Oh! It, 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 it now happens with the other case, in, the, in both cases you can have multiple realization. So it's not a disanalogy with the mental case any longer. Okay. The only remaining disanalogy is to do with whether the actual physics allows for multiple realization. So, but... Good. I have a very simple headed sort of problem here, uh, right? And so maybe somebody can just easily disabuse me of this, right? So what we're sort of saying is I've got sort of Q1 equals S, <coughs> and I've got Q2 equals S. But I have Q1's not equal to Q2. Oh, but maybe if it's in different possible worlds, it's okay because the, that's the. Does that make sense? I can't have the, both the loops and the strings sure. as space time, but they're not I, equal to each other. I right? if there was a, a worry here, it was a worry that there was like a disanalogy with the mental case in this case. And it's like whether you allow for. I don't know whether you're getting an identity theory kind of functionalism or a non-identity theory kind of functionalism, like a role or realized functionalism, yeah. still they're patterned the same way in both cases. So it's like if the concern is it's a disanalogy from the mental case, then we can resist that concern. Yeah, no, 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 I didn't mean, so I didn't mean that. I, right. my, it was rather the other way. The, okay. the ways you solve, solve within the mental case yeah, need to be kind of, should work here as well. I would like to add that even if there is this analogy between the two cases, that, in my view, does not sort of uh, invalidate the space-time functionalism. It may just work slightly differently in that case, the, from the you know, mind. You mean regarding the case. multiple realizability? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's not fully analogous, but it's a, well, functionalism might still yeah. be the best. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, and obviously the point of the talk is it's actually really quite different in some ways. All right, uh, Niels. Yeah, maybe I'm mixing up uh, your work, so the two of you with that of you and Morson, but in some of that you say that you refrain from taking a sense of whether you're a realizer or role functionalist, right? That's, That's the, the, the two of you, yes. right. And what I'm kind of wondering about is, from a naturalist perspective, I mean, it seems quite possible that the strict and gravity is compatible with string theory, or especially CDT, asymptotic safety, and so they're all compatible with one another. I mean, one side of the coin and the other side of the coin. So why don't you just take a stance for, for being either, let's say, for, for being, say, a role functionist rather than a, than a realizer functionist? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering. Yeah. I was going to let you answer it, but uh, then I was going to say, yeah, we say, I think we say the same thing. In the, there's a we, we place where we say, you know, yeah. it could be entities, roles, yeah, properties, states, whatever. We actually don't take us. Or maybe for Jimmy, so I, I don't know, maybe I don't know the theory behind so well, but I always thought realizer functionalism comes with a different sense of multiple reversibility and sense of potential, as you were pointing out, and role functionalism, sense of actual multiple realizability, right? So in, I don't know if I just look at the facts right now, but kind of empty series say, and now they seem to be competitive with, with each other, would you say one should rather opt for a role functionalist perspective, even though normally you refrain from taking 
Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I, have, I have not thought about this problem, uh, yeah. but can I just say something very quickly? Ramification of this kind is not going to be very friendly to role functionalism. So, uh, if you want to keep this picture, realizer functionalism is probably where you're going to want to go, and that's why people pile on Lewis be precisely because of the multiple realities. But I take it that this was your worry, and yeah. this is your sort of simple-minded yeah. worry, right? Yeah. So yeah. this might push you that way. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Ah, yeah. I'm going to decline to make any definitive statement here because we saw it in, Al, in Al's talk earlier. That if I say something here, maybe in 20 years, someone's going to be pinning it on me. Well, not even 20 years, I guess 40 years, someone's going to be pinning it on me in a talk or something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think what we're trying to do in the book, at least, is kind of neutral on this. I mean, I think we're just so much trying to, you know, this is, a, as I said, sort of a kind of idealized framework of what's going on. And then we're looking at the individual sort of physical theories to tell the story. I don't know. I, I, maybe it's something to think about at the conclusion that we, is there some pattern about whether it's entities or roles or whatever functionalism that we're seeing and appearing. That's a, that's a reasonable question. Right, thanks very much. <coughs> um, uh, I guess I want to raise a bit the way you, you have had the condition three, um, but I think we kind of change our mind, the two of you, after the, the discussion. Um, because I might rather change your mind a bit on what's, what's physical science. But it seems to me now that you put a little bit more on physical science, science than you used to, to, to put before. And actually, perhaps what I would call the hard problem or the explanatory gap problem would be more at the level two of the physical science. Right? If you can, at each stage of the mathematical derivation, mm. explain to me what's going on. Uh, you just give me the, the physical explanation. Then for me, it's fine. There is no explanatory gap. So, in, in actually, in the synthesis of the paper, I distinguish between two different problems, the hard problem, or explanatory gap problem, and the ontological problem. And the ontological problem is perhaps more what you want to, to stay away from, that will correspond to condition three. Mm -hmm. And the ontological problem is to understand what's real. Uh, like, you can be a dualist about uh, consciousness in the physical world. It should be kind of dualist, as there is a physical, the, 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 spatial temporal world, there's a non-spatial temporal world, these kind of things, or should, have, should we have an identity theory, or should we use grounding to read the two ontologies, or as I like, should we use composition? So those sort of, 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 of questions will be the ontological uh, question that will correspond to your condition three. But I think in the paper, uh, what I call the hard problem, would be perhaps more as a level two. So I, I will have no problem mm -hmm. with, with, with your story if you can give me uh, a story with kind of reasonable sense of what you call physical science, like you understand a bit what's going on in the physics uh, beyond the mathematics. Um, and yeah, if, if, if that's the case, then I guess we, if you agree with what I just sketched out, I guess we're kind of on the same page, even though I want to, uh, with other like, like Al or, or Sam, do more work at the ontological level, mm -hmm. but we can agree perhaps at the at, at level two, right? And another thing I want to add is that for me, functionalism is a bit uh, tricky because you can have a, a minimal form of it, where you just used kind of uh, linguistic functionalism or logical functionalism or analytic functionalism, whatever how you call it, and you try to commit yourself as best as you can about what, uh, what, what mm. How, how the ontology is to make this kind of functionalist story works. Uh, so what I, what I dislike perhaps in this, um, uh, sometimes what people have the tendency to think that functionalism is addressing the more ontological questions. Because basically what I do in the paper is say, well look, functionalism can come in many flavors. Yeah, you could have, so as Neil said, you can have raw functionalism, occupant functionalism. Um, so you have different flavors that will lead to different answer about what the ontology in the world. But you don't really, um, if you don't want to get to what you call level three, you can steer away from that and just use a kind of functionality. I mean, from my point of view, perhaps the most natural ontology to apply to you would be some kind of 
identity theory with a kind of many to one composition, mm -hmm. like uh, mm -hmm. you just have uh, spatial temporal enti entities are just identical to collections of non spatial temporal entities. But of course, you don't want to because that, yeah, that's roughly my overall reaction to <coughs> that. Great, that's really, the, yeah, no, that, that actually makes me feel like I did kind of actually pull out the important things that were going on in our conversation. And that's incredibly helpful for, I think, understanding where, where we were at, uh, at least for me, so, and you, since we had the conversation. But I, I hope that sort of was helpful for people, you know, as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that, that helps me understand as well. I mean, and I think, um, I think it was Sachs's question. This is, uh, you know, coming back to this is sort of an idealization. I take it one way of putting what you're saying is, what does this equals really kind of mean? Yes. And that kind of comes at level at level three. Yeah. And even a bit two, perhaps. Which? Uh, uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Both, both yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, no. You'd have that would certainly inform what was here. You wouldn't be. A, it wouldn't be a priori. You'd want to see how the actual yes. physically salient explanation went. Yeah, so that's very helpful for where I can see there being sort of another question. Um, and, then, and it sounds like, I think this is what I'm, we kind of, I meant, or, you know, we meant all along was, there's quite a, there is a lot packed into, you know, what it is to be physically salient. Like, there, you know, that's what we really think is, you know, really tracks how the world, how, how things are happening in the world and the ways in which, you know, one thing really kind of can explain another thing. So it's, you know, what we count as sort of a, a valid explanation, as a legitimate explanation. Um, and I think that, you know, that's not, it's going to be way thicker than just sort of, sort of hypothetical deductive, uh, uh, deductive nomological kind of explanation or anything like that. There's going to be a lot more constraints on what counts as an explanation and what things we can kind of appeal to. So, and I think it's sort of critical that that is sort of part of the package that comes with the scientific theory. It's not just sort of this proposition QG that, you know, is, is, is that we have to come to accept. We have to kind of come to accept in the ways that we can actually apply, apply that theory to make, make derivations and you know, figuring questions like that out, you know, is part of, you know, scientific revolution. Sometimes you just have to radically rethink what kind of explanations are legitimate. You know, so, you know, the obvious example that we talk, you know, the one we talk about in the chapter has to do with, so what the admissibility of action at a distance explanations, whether that, you know, an explanation in terms of action at a distance is physically salient or not. and. That's something people have come to change their minds about and sort of understand in different ways. And, you know, in some ways it's sort of mysterious how that sort of happens. It's not a purely, you know, algorithmic sort of process, but it is part of what it comes to accept. It is to accept a theory and ultimately rests on the empirical success of the theory with those explanations. I at the beginning, you said I should feel free to add or deduct. Yes. yes. Maybe, maybe one thing I would like to deduct is uh, the strong emphasis on there being a disanalogy between the philosophy of mind case and the space time functionalism in the sort of the direction that Sam was pointing at. It, because it seems to me what is considered troublesome, and whether that's sort of the reverse direction or not, depends on what we take to be troublesome in the mind case and of course we might say like well of course you know there's the given brain we understand that we know that that's the unproblematic part and now we want to see how this troublesome <coughs> mind stuff can come out of that and then of course the direction is reversed but we might also say like well look the mental things the delights and the pains we have that's given that we know that we must find some sort of that's unproblematically there. We want to understand what that the nature of those things could possibly be. You know how they're built up. What's their constitution? Uh, you know, um, and then we do uh, and propose a theory of uh, neuroscience 
uh, like step two, and then we show in step three how you know mathematically in a physically salient way or maybe mentally salient way or whatever you want to call that somehow we get delights and pains out of that and then when you think of the, the mind case that way that would seem to me in a, in a much closer analogy to the space-time functionalism again so i think i just do disagree with that right so the the neuroscience part, it seems we can have complete sort of epistemic access to that that worrying about without bringing in the, its connection to the mind at all. We can get completely fine on the neuroscience, the theory of electromagnetism, and then go on, logically speaking, to see how it plays the functional roles. It's in no way depend, I don't, I don't need to know anything about light to know that, you know, but we need about to know electromagnetic fields. But we need to know about space time necessarily yes. in order to do quantum gravity. Yes. There's nothing I can kind of do just at the quantum gravity level to kind of vindicate that theory. And that's uh, in a stronger sense than just the heuristics, as Emilia was suggesting. Yeah, I mean, I think <coughs> so, right. So this is the empirical. Incoherence kind of point. This has yes. to be referred to space time stuff. But but maybe you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to push this a little bit further. Maybe, yeah, yeah. you know, in the mental case, you could say, like, well, you just misunderstand the mental situation. There, too, in order to, neurosci to do neuroscience, to have empirical coherence on new neuroscientific theories, you need to have mental states. You couldn't have evidence without mental states because. Scientists who confirm uh, or disconfirm yeah, yeah, yeah. neuroscientific theories, they have mental states. And I don't know, I mean, this is out of my pay grade now, but. Uh, <laughs> this is one, okay. Maybe so you could try it's not that you don't have to have the mental states, right? If you believe the functionalism, of course, if the, neuros, if the, if the brain is performing the mental functions, they're all new mental states. But whether well, you have you to kind of know anything necessary. about them. Yes, maybe you do. So that I would deny. I mean, okay. except in that sort of transcendental sense that you need scientists who are doing the. Ex That's why I liked the EM case, right? I mean, I, I don't need. To, I mean, I guess I have to do it. No, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't think I even need light to to be able to know the EM. I mean, as a matter of fact, we have eyes, and so we can see things. But I could imagine doing it by whatever touch or something. So I could Good. have a, you know complete confidence and grasp on the, the uh, EM theory. That seems fine to me. Sam, very quickly. Yeah, just very quickly, it strikes me that this notion of what's troublesome and what's not is super slippery, right? And I think that that's what's coming out here, is you've got one sort of sense of it, you've got a different sense. And that's why I was like, maybe just get rid of it. Yeah. Maybe it's not that different. I was just trying to yeah. you know, deduct some and <laughs> see if I add something else, what happens. Marta has one last question. Yeah, super it quickly. So, short one. Uh, if I'm asking, well, the, like, the emergence is given by the, um, what do you call it, aggregation. So the, the emergence work is given by that. So my point is, doesn't this in, in some sense imply that you need um, a metaphysical science already just, just because of, you have this aggregation, in a sense? So you have Good, good, yeah. So what counts as a, an aggregate, as a physically valid aggregation and what, what doesn't? Yeah, but it's like, like this, um, the fact that you have the, like this aggregation doesn't like imply that you have to, you know, conceptualize in some sense this, uh, like how, how does it work? And in this sense, you, you have to uh, talk about what is metaphysically happening. So I, I think I, so... Here's how I was interpreting the, the question. Well, look, there are kind of lots of functions that you might sort of put here and lots of ways you might sort of arbitrarily put together the, the non-spatio-temporal um, atoms. Just as, you know, if I had a, a gas, I might just sort of put together, aggregate, you know, an, a molecule of the air in this room with, a, you know, with some molecule from the sun and uh, okay, that doesn't really count as an aggregation and 
so in the sort of in the usual cases aggregation you know usually we think you're aggregating things that are close together that's sort of a rule about what you can aggregate and what you can't so I think I'm re sort of retelling your question in the way, or I'm trying to retell the question in the way that I, I would think about it. Again, this is built, but I would say that was built into sort of physically salient, which aggregates actually were sort of explanatory and could actually do the work that's sort of being envisioned here. But I think of that as being sort of, phys sort of physical principle, not metaphysical principle. Okay. We're running out of time. We will reconvene at 3.30. Please join me in thanking Nick once again.